This episode is sponsored by Skillshare. You might have lived in some places you thought were real holes, but for future residents of the moon, that would actually be a good thing. So today we are returning to the moon, something humans haven't physically done in almost 50 years since the Apollo program. That will be fairly important to our discussion today about setting up large scale and permanent facilities in craters on the moon, because when we think about going back to the moon, a major question that always comes up is why, and what will be achieved by walking around collecting rock samples for a few days, and the answer to that really is not much. Those Apollo rock samples were of great scientific worth, and more would be handy but not enough to justify a mission there at outrageous expense and more than a bit of danger, and why wouldn't we just send robotic sampling missions? That's a lot of why the US hasn't gone back and nobody's worked too hard to be the second to get there. It's also why when we talk about returning, we tend to talk seriously about long term or permanent facilities. Not only would a permanent base let us get some serious science done, but allows us to begin exploiting the moon as a gateway to space development and off-world industry, as we looked at last time in Moon Industrial Complex. Inevitably when topics of bases on the moon and where to locate them come up, the popular answer tends to be one of the major craters, and usually one of the ones near the poles. We'll explain why that is today, but also some reasons that's not always ideal or necessary. Polar craters are our best bet, as we'll see today, but there are some good competitors, such as equatorial craters or lava tubes. Our focus today though will be on how such cities will look and how those communities might develop. We're interested in cities and settlements, not early bases, stations, or outposts, so we have to start by explaining why certain places are attractive as colony locations. To do that, we must first say that these craters are often huge. Now, the moon is covered in craters and the vast majority of them are tiny, but most folks picture a moon crater as several meters across or maybe the size of a football stadium, and of course many are, but the ones we tend to be interested in and talk about for bases are much larger, and we have craters on the moon larger than most nations on Earth. Now while a crater is usually a lot shallower than they are wide, this still means the big ones can have rim walls many kilometers high and basins many kilometers deep. That tends to make us think of big domes over these mostly circular craters, be it the small ones or big ones. Their shape having the potential to facilitate construction of a dome is not the reason for our interest in craters, rather the steep and high sides is what we're interested in. A big deep crater that gets little sunlight can, we believe, get a lot of ice and other elements down in that bottom, which is obviously a big boon for any developing base or colony. Those rim walls are an even bigger deal though, because the moon has very long nights and also has no atmosphere, so when the sun sets it gets way darker. If you're on a mountain, you'll see the sun set later than those on the ground do, and not by a small amount either. This is even more the case on our airless moon that is a lot less wide than Earth and much more sharply curved. As an example, on Mount Everest on Earth, you can see about 230 miles or 370 kilometers away. That's almost 1% of Earth's circumference, so the Sun is going to rise about 1% earlier and set 1% later there as a result. That probably doesn't sound like much, but it does mean the day starts 14 minutes earlier and ends 14 minutes later, if it were at the equator anyway. For stuff like solar power and agriculture, that's not a trivial difference. It's far more extreme on the Moon, about 7 extra hours of daylight is added to any position that high up on the Moon on its equator. However, that much extended daylight time is not because the moon is less wide, indeed the horizon is actually closer to you as a result. If you transplanted Mount Everest to the moon, you'd only be able to see half as far before the horizon was reached, and that horizon distance covers when the sun sets or rises. Rather, what mostly controls that altitude induced extension of day length is that the moon's day is a month long. So being up high is less effective than on Earth for letting you see far distances, but that's more than counteracted by that really long day. The reverse is also true, that being in a crater at the bottom will massively shorten your horizon and thus your daylight hours too, which makes for a very big temperature difference between rim wall peaks, crater bottoms, and general lunar surface. There's obviously no sea level on the moon, not yet anyway. 
We can take advantage of that temperature difference by using heat engines, solar thermal power, to make some pretty efficient power generators, but more on that later. Now I mentioned what these are like on the equator but it's different at the poles. As an example, on a sphere that was spinning on the exact same plane as the Sun it orbited, no axial tilt, the North and South Pole never actually get dark. There is no rock rotating between you and your light source. Almost everything has an axial tilt and indeed the Moon has one relative to Earth, which it orbits, and relative to the Sun, which Earth orbits. So the pores of the Moon do get dark. However, you don't need to be up too high there to be sticking up so much that you get constant sunlight, and indeed those bigger crater rim walls near the poles stick up enough that they get an awful lot more sunlight than half on half off you would expect to get on a smooth rotating body. What's more, there is no air so there is no wind, and gravity is weaker, so it's very easy to build tall skinny towers on the moon with great big parabolic mirrors on them shining light down on that crater. Done right, you can keep sunlight on there for a very long portion of the lunar day, even rotating some way on a 24 hour schedule to mimic something Earth-like. So that's our first big concept change when looking at crater cities, they're not a big crater with a big dome on them. Indeed a single dome is mostly rather pointless, it's vulnerable to catastrophic failure and has to be built all at once. At most you might have a big crater basically bubble wrapped in smaller domes built as needed with one big one over top as a secondary shell or shield. Indeed what we'd expect initially is a few small facilities inside a given crater with some rim wall towers with mirrors on them that also served as transmitters. Along that rim wall you'd see towers stretching up high enough to be able to be catching the sun and beaming it down to the crater wall, or smaller facilities in it initially, adding more towers as you went. Those would probably swivel their light away on a 24 hour basis to simulate daytime better, that excess light in night phase probably being cast onto some of the thermal wadis we discussed for solar thermal power generation in the Industrial Complex episode. Indeed, if LED lighting is the preferred method of illumination for manned facilities, beams and pipe light may be limited to industrial uses and growing food. I should also note that you'd likely be using mirrors for lighting farms as opposed to classic domes anyway. Everything weighs less there, so it's very easy to scoop up tons of rock and pile them on top of structures for added protection. You can then bounce light in, filtered of harmful frequencies of light, through windows on the side to a reflective ceiling that lights the place up. Those windows can be down tunnels so you have thick walls too and with pressure sensitive hatches able to slam shut if the window was damaged. This approach is a lot more work intensive than a dome to initially build, but far sturdier, safer, and probably more productive and cheaper to maintain in the long term. As time goes on you'd add more towers and bigger mirrors to that rim wall. Depending on crater size you might need millions of people to comfortably fill such a crater, and it could easily spill out onto the outside of the crater wall and the plain beyond. You also have the option of foregoing those towers in favor of satellites that beam down power and light and signals too, but I suspect the towers will tend to be the preferred method. Transmission is a big deal on the Moon as we only have line of sight, no atmospheric bouncing of signals and that horizon is shorter, so everything has to be via tall towers or off satellites. That's not for communicating home to Earth particularly, one side of the Moon always points at Earth and the other side does not. Those dark side bases, at least dark in terms of having line of sight to Earth, that are fairly near the Earth side might employ very large towers or multiple towers serving as relay stations to achieve a direct connection to Earth that's not dependent on satellites. Odds are though that as the Moon develops we'd see transmitter towers pop up on every peak, particularly as you can't really do geosynchronous or lunosynchronous satellites for the Moon, and even if you tried you'd be introducing an enormous signal lag. That's one way we might see crater villages pop up too, you put up a tower for power and transmission relay and a small settlement develops around it. There was no fossil fuels on the Moon and no air to use to burn it, so electric power for vehicles and robots is probably going to be the big thing from day one. And while batteries are always good as a reserve, I suspect we see a lot of wireless microwave power transmission incorporated into everything, which means blanketing the surface with power relays and that can be done incrementally too. Now back to those crater cities themselves. First, I want to stress again that we are looking at cities today, or at least large settlements, this episode is not about initial bases except as telling us where those bigger settlements would likely originate from. 
those initially tiny bases would logically tend to be where a city arose from, so we need to consider initial base placement, and we looked at bases more themselves in moon based concepts and Battle for the Moon. To discuss those early settlements better, we have to decide if the moon's gravity by itself is enough for people to live comfortably and healthily, and of course we don't know yet. We know it's unhealthy to live in no gravity but we don't know if you need Earth normal, or close to it, or if even lower gravity than the moon might be just fine. If it isn't though, we need simulated gravity in the settlement, potentially spinning the entire thing around inside that crater, but for today we will assume that moon gravity is good enough, or that if not, people's individual homes or main workplaces could incorporate a small rotating section. Those would be interesting rotating houses or apartments, as your door would be in your roof and you'd probably walk down your ceiling to a floor that was basically a spinning cylinder, slightly curved to be narrower at the bottom. You wouldn't have windows except maybe in that ceiling, and I suspect those would tend to be tilted or wobble just a bit to keep Earth in the same place with the night sky seemingly whirling around it. It might be rather nauseating to see that whirling around several times a minute on the smaller ones. That's an option, as is make a sizing it to include a whole crater, but we'll instead assume that folks can either live in moon gravity, just fine all the time, or need some minor medical assistance of some sort to do so, or that years long deployments with occasional trips back to Earth or a rotating space station are adequate. That's the easiest case and the one that most favors major moon expansion. If you need to live under spin gravity most of the time, then expansion around Earth-Moon space is likely to be in cylinder habitats and not on the Moon. The Moon is still industrially and scientifically attractive, thus encouraging folks to live there, but I wouldn't expect major residential settlement. Alternatively, if you can live just fine in some personal house or dome of your own, then it's a lot more attractive. Incidentally, I doubt we'd ever see a ton of classic single domes. It is possible to flat out terraform the moon complete with oceans and air, though quite a pain, but while it's airless, you view the world through windows with rapid automatic shutters in case of damage, not while sitting in t-shirts and shorts under a big glass dome. I'm sure that would happen, but more in the way folks get a kick out of sitting on cliffs or a boat, for a bit of a thrill not to relax and soak up the sun. It's just a lot safer to use a mirror and a lens to bounce such light in some nice garden and lawn you've got growing in something akin to a bomb-proof bunker. This is especially true if the gravity isn't enough for constant comfortable living, and so homes need to be spun and thus might as well be buried underground too anyway. This doesn't really give us a lush fertile crater folks might be picturing though, but a few caveats on that. First, A local culture gets influenced and built around by what the major advantages and disadvantages of the area are, and the ever-present fear of a catastrophic breach or puncture is going to be on their minds no matter how safe you make things, same as hurricane fears are for folks on coasts or flooding for those on rivers or earthquakes for those on the Pacific Rim, expected to influence every aspect of their life, subtly or overtly. That might diminish with time though, micrometeors represent no true threat to a dome, and bigger ones are likely to be easily detected and vaporized by the sort of infrastructure we'd expect in place if the moon was seriously colonized. But customs and traditions and building regulations and the architecture and lifestyles resulting from them are likely to hang around long after the need is gone. Second, keeping that in mind, technology does improve and especially where necessity drives it, As we mentioned in Spaceship Design, folks living in a spaceship have this same concern and might address it by just having ultra-comfortable spacesuits as default clothing, complete with some self-inflating head bulb that could trigger if the pressure dropped, or some life capsule drone following them around who could expand and swallow them if the dome ruptured and they got blown out. Indeed it's pretty probable folks in the future, even just a few decades from now, will be used to being followed around everywhere by some sort of drone, or a whole posse of them and the low lunar gravity will make buoyancy and lift of such drones easier. Third, technology improves and we just won't have a bunch of crater cities on the moon this century, regardless of technology. Communities don't just emerge and grow that rapidly. Even if we got the tech and infrastructure to do this all tomorrow, it would still be generations before there were a bunch of major settlements on the moon. That's a lot of time for other technologies to develop and grow mundane and routine, like minor cybernetic augmentation that lets folks wander around a vacuum, conscious and somewhat safe for a few minutes, or having clothing that was literally made of a bunch of microscopic robots that just swarmed into whatever shapes you needed them to be, be it a spacesuit or a simple tool. 
I'd also not be surprised if a lot of folks just had themselves rebuilt so they could just live in an unpressurized hut and stroll outside onto the airless low gravity surface entirely casually, or at least virtually through advanced telepresence. Fourth, just because homes and workplaces and other places where folks spent most of their time might tend to be carved into a rim wall like some cave or bunker doesn't mean the crater would be lifeless. Whether it's a big dome or a bunch of small ones connected together, that's perfectly fine for crops and parks. Especially for farmland, where most of the farming is probably largely automated anyway. A catastrophic puncture just means the loss of one plot of land and the organics inside it. Not a good thing, but not some horrible headline reading Dome Punctured, a dozen children sucked into the void. I would bet most craters would get terraformed and have a big lake at the bottom, meaning having a center island around the peak that often juts from the center of craters. This isn't just to be pretty either, you'll very likely be setting up your solar thermal power generation to initially take advantage of that cold crater bottom as one end of your heat reservoir for a heat engine to produce power, and as that expands or if you're using nuclear power instead, it's nice to have a giant puddle of water to use as a cooling pond and you could keep that evaporating and raining on the crater wall in a small single dome crater or pump the moisture around to other tiers of the crater domes. The center of the crater would also receive more radiation than the rim areas which are shadowed by crater walls themselves. Then you'd probably have many tiered and individually domed levels with doors and windows in them leading into homes and workplaces. This would probably sprawl out onto the exterior of rim walls and onto the plains, though likely in growing crater sprawls, as many of them touch or even combine, more like an upside down city with a foam of domes at street level and the buildings underground. Indeed, while there are a lot of big craters on the Moon, as mentioned earlier, most are smaller, often craters inside craters, and a lot of these probably would be a single dome. You might dome a crater inside a crater or near your main crater and turn it into a stadium for instance. Playing any ball games there is likely to be interesting though considering how long a ball, be it a baseball or soccer ball or volleyball, is going to spend in the air before landing. That might require some rather large stadiums as a result. I'd also not be surprised if a vacuum version developed a lot, there's nothing really stopping you from playing baseball in spacesuits for instance. Ultimately though, I think we'd still see those major habitats really being built into the crater walls, not down at their bottom or on their skin but safely burrowed inside. It's just easier to have a mirror ray concentrate light and send it down a shaft that can automatically seal if punctured to be spread out and bounced around inside some places safely tucked away under meters of sturdy rock, with large gardens and farms inside and out. Those would be rather beautiful gems for folks to look at from Rimwall and nearby orbital facilities, but on the Earth side of the Moon at least, you'd always be able to see Earth right there anyway so we might see more of this crater parks and farm on the far or dark side of the Moon. Of course these might serve as seeds to eventually terraforming the Moon, but that's a topic for another day. A bit of a recurring theme we have for space colonization is that it will be very skill intensive, and in our increasingly knowledge and skill based future, it's going to be quite a challenge to ensure small groups of explorers or colonists have rapid access to all the information they need and in a format they can absorb most easily, and quickly. Of course that's a problem we have nowadays down here on Earth too, and is where online videos and classes like those offered by Skillshare can be invaluable. Skillshare offers thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people on topics including illustration, design, photography, video, freelancing, and more. Running a graphics intensive show like SFIA and being trained as a physicist, not a graphic designer, I found their graphic design courses like Aaron Draplin's 21 Tips for Speeding Up Your Design Workflow to be incredibly helpful in improving my own work and Skillshare has classes to fit your schedule and skill level on many helpful topics. A premium membership is less than $10 a month and gives you access to that course and all the rest, and you can try it out for free. To sign up, visit the link in the description, and as a special offer, the first 500 people to use this link will get two free months of Skillshare premium membership. Act now for this special offer and start learning today. So next week we'll head back deep into the fall future to look at the end of the universe, the heat death, and ways we might postpone that. 
and in two weeks we'll look at ways we might avoid potential catastrophes near our home in time and space as we discuss climate change mitigation techniques for natural or artificial calamities, be it volcanoes, asteroids, or carbon dioxide. But before then, we have a bonus episode coming up this weekend where we'll explore how we might coexist with artificial intelligence. For alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the notifications bell. And if you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button and share it with others. And if you'd like to support future episodes, visit our website, IsaacArthur.net, to donate to the channel or check out some of the awesome SFIA merchandise. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.